The opinions you hear on Your Mountain from individual hosts or guests do not necessarily represent those of Your Mountain, our sponsors, or other entities we're affiliated with professionally or otherwise. You've waited long enough. Go listen to the show. There are millions of acres of opportunity out there. They belong to you. Every day, decisions are being made that affect your land, your water, your wildlife. You should know about them. This is Your Mountain. Hey, everybody. Welcome back for another episode of the Your Mountain Podcast. This episode, we're going to continue our discussion from last week with Gabriella Hoffman of the District of Conservation Podcast. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the podcast. What do you want to talk about? This craziest thing happened here in my basement. I was sitting here the other night and I walked out and there was this giant stainless steel obelisk in the middle of my basement. This morning it's gone. It's in, uh, what, uh, we decided it's in Austria now? I don't know. Do you know where it's at, Gabriella? Romania. I don't know where in Romania, but somewhere remotely in Romania. So, so we, th- we think that the, the Utah obelisk <laughs> has moved to Romania? That's well, what they report. Well. I think that's crazy. Imagine, imagine the guys that were out doing surveys that found it and landed and were like, what is this thing? Weren't they doing a bighorn sheep survey when they discovered this via helicopter? Yeah, yeah. yeah and, so then, pre- and then they, they're like, wait, what is that? And they landed and, and found the giant. It was actually a lot bigger than I thought it would be. So um, for people who don't know, out in the middle of the BLM in Utah, um, some dudes doing a survey roll in and find this stainless steel obelisk, right? Just sitting there, uh, just sitting there. clearly placed by somebody. I mean, it's like, it's not like it's a refrigerator that just fell, you know, that somebody threw out of the back of the truck. I mean, this thing's set up. Um, and just as quickly as it appeared, it's gone. Is this something we're going to see pop up all over the world now for the next six months? And and then it's going to lead to like Kanye West's next, uh, CD release or something. (laughs) Yeah. Never know. I'm looking at you, Gabrielle. I want, I'm at you. <laughs> like, what is going on? Clearly, this didn't come from the West. Someone outside of this area is responsible this for is this. This is a beltway issue. Yeah. Come on. Help, yeah. help us out. <laughs> but maybe some modern artists did. And I don't know if some people say it's because UFO sightings are now being confirmed. Maybe some extraterrestrials placed it there. I have no idea. But well, it's like 12 feet tall above the, I mean, it's buried and then above the ground is 12 feet tall. And it's, I mean, it doesn't look light. I mean, somebody, it had to get there somehow in a remote yeah. area. Did you guys see the BLM's press release in about, it's pretty scathing uh-uh. actually. And they, they complained about visitors like treading on vegetation. They left behind human waste and that they kind of exhausted the area because it's not accommodating to large crowds. So uh, they were not following the leave no trace protocols. They were kind of being disrespectful towards it. So um, while they enjoyed the publicity, they were kind of disgruntled over the fact that so many went there to this kind of unstable ground and uh, caused a little bit of mayhem and, and left it worse than they found it. Does anybody I, I've else... never heard of the federal agencies being mad that people use public lands. That's exactly <laughs> what I was going to say. Does anybody else find it ironic that you have these land management agencies who like the first thing that they do when they tell you how important their jobs are and public lands are is complain when people use public lands. And like, I complain when people use public lands, when I'm out hunting, I complain all the time when I see somebody else four ridges over, like, Oh, they're in my spot. You That's know, true. I do that, but <laughs> yeah, man, I, it's, it's, it's frustrating to me and it, it for sure happens. And I could go through lots of examples. I'm telling you, the more we talk about this though, the more I'm thinking it's Kanye West. <laughs> like you like that th- you guys like that theory right it's got to be somebody's promoting a big album yeah. drop well just so everyone knows Kanye does live in Wyoming and I know a guy who in fact we have, uh you know this is funny you uh uh Katie uh How your was, friend yeah. yet was up in up in uh in Cody doing a shooting match that we that I was I was working with the folks who were hosting this shooting match and 
rolled into Kanye West just walking down the street, right? Yeah, her and her husband. More so her husband. He spotted him, took a selfie, and then she photobombed him in the picture, her husband. <laughs> uh, so that was really funny <laughs> to yeah. see that. And then I have a friend, Kyle Lamb, who was actually in Cody Weaver elk hunting together. And then he came out and on his way, you know, he went to the restaurant to go get a steak. This is kind of a funny story. So he goes in to get a steak. He sees Kanye West there. And Kyle Lamb, you know, fairly notable guy. Uh, But Kyle doesn't know Kanye West. And so he feels weird about it. So Kyle pulls out his cell phone and calls Donald Trump Jr., who just happens to be buddies on his cell phone, and has him call Kanye West so he can coordinate the meeting of, you know, one of the most famous soldiers in the history of America with one of the greatest pie pie cons in the history of America, all coordinated by uh, Donald Trump Jr. So did they talk to one another? Yeah, I've got the picture. Kyle, he, he sent it to me on my phone. It's a pretty funny picture. It's just like these two fairly different but yet iconic people standing in a steak joint and Cody shaking hands. It's pretty funny. So anyway, I told you all that story just so you all know. Yes, it was Kanye West. Um, for sure, it was Kanye. I have it on good authority and uh, it will continue to be um, – go by his, you know, at least four of his albums. Go by four of his albums. And tell him I said you're welcome. So, so on the monolith, the latest is that uh, there were some folks. There's a TikTok video of, of four guys who went out and and destroyed the monolith, took it down, and wheeled it out of there on a wheelbarrow, and said, "Don't leave your trash on public land." Well, we all know that didn't happen because Kanye would have used a lot more than four guys in a wheelbarrow. <laughs> yeah. So, well, they, that's they fake. Did it, they did it on uh, on. November 30th, so I don't see how it made it to Romania so damn fast. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not from this world. FedEx. Maybe, maybe they listed on, on Amazon Marketplace and it was or whatever, and uh, they had Prime Delivery, 24-hour Prime. I don't know. Speaking of federal agencies being angry about people using their stuff. Ooh, here we go. We saw, we saw an interesting article come out that suggested that our national parks are overrun. Well, we've all known that for a long time. And the way to take care of that is charge people more for going to national parks. Gabriella, what the heck is going on? Yeah, this doesn't surprise me from the individual who wrote it, who in conservative politics, he's kind of uh, viewed in an interesting light, but I won't so much dwell into it. But Kevin Williamson is known for being kind of this provocateur a uh, polemic figure, and I don't know what ate him to compel him to write this piece. Probably a failure to understand uh, what the national park system is, but he essentially compared it to Disneyland, and in order to preserve their natural beauty and their legacy, people have to cough up more money because that's how you preserve them. That's how it's going to make people less incentivized to go there if you hike up the prices it's going to reduce overcrowding which i don't think is a logical uh thought there um but he basically explored this option compared it to disneyland and said well all these people are paying for disneyland and it's kind of a national treasure so they might as well pay more money to enter national parks for an an actual national natural treasure yeah and and you know one thing is artificial Obviously, Disneyland, it's make-believe. It's very creative. Walt Disney was a genius and a pioneer. I think his legacy has been trashed in recent memory. But that is nothing compared to a national park. Like my parents, personally speaking, my parents were always keen on vacationing at national parks in and around them. And I've seen, I think, seven with my family, and I've seen several by myself. But we took family vacations to national parks in the surrounding regions because my parents thought, you know, we're going to make more memories. If we take you girls to nature, me and my sister, uh, see some wildlife, go hiking, see the lake, see the different structure, see old faithful, see all these different attractions and different interest points in national parks. And I remember, and I still talk to my folks about it today that I always am grateful for them to take us to national parks because I have good memories that I'm going to keep forever and hopefully tell kids one day that I have and hopefully grandkids if I'm able to have them too one day. So you remember your time in a national park, it can be argued. 
but Disneyland, I've gone to Disneyland a few times or Disney World I haven't gone to, but I grew up near Disneyland and I went there. It was fine, but I don't remember really any memories from there. So maybe I'm of a different thinking compared to many people who live close to cities, but I don't think you can compare Disneyland to a Yellowstone or a similar national park. I think those are apples and oranges. And if you want to truly understand the National Park Service, it's it's not supposed to be a corporate entity. And I say this as someone who supports the ideal of free market environmentalism. I'm a pretty limited government person. And I think the government does have a rightful place in managing public lands and whatnot. And that extends to National Park Service lands too. And I don't think people want to see it desecrated and kind of morph into a Disneyland type entity that completely defeats the purpose of what they are. And hiking up prices to price out people in lower and middle income brackets from accessing the park is going to create this, I guess, not distaste, but this kind of disdain for the park. And we see a lot of people accessing parks now, especially during COVID. And certainly they've probably replaced restrictions on the parks, but you see kind of this resurgence of discovery and that price point to access different parks. For instance, in Shenandoah, it's like 30 bucks for your party of like, it could be your, your event conventional car. You could have four or five people. So for the week you can pay $30 to access and reaccess, let's say Shenandoah park. That's a really good deal. And a lot of people come through there and certainly it's a lot more foot traffic than usual, but there's still this kind of novelty where you're paying to enjoy the park and those monies go towards hopefully with the great American outdoors act now kind of being purposed more fine-tuned to help address kind of the backlog issues and deferred maintenance issues that go there, but it's affordable. You have a memorable time. It's not expensive. You're not wasting money on kind of subpar food, carnival food, although there is some good food in Disneyland from what I remember, but it's, it's just a completely different experience. And I think, Mr. Williamson doesn't have an understanding of that. And he can come about it from his perspective because he's probably a well-to-do guy. Uh, He wrote a new book kind of chastising people from rural America. He grew up in like rural Texas and kind of wrote this book to kind of like spit on where he came from. So he's kind of been on this bitter tirade recently. So maybe this falls in the purview of his uh, kind of tirade against things for common folk. Um, but I don't know what inspired him to write this and that kind of unsettled me, but I don't know if you guys got around to reading it as well and what your thoughts are on it too. Well, it was dumb. Good Dave. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. I, that's a pretty good summary. Yeah. I I, I thought it was, it was, it was simplistic and wrong. I mean, it was like to, to, to use this idea that we're to solve an overcrowding issue. We're just going to price everybody, but the elites out is, like if one, okay, it's a it's the simplistic. We're just going to use, um, you know, a capitalistic mar- market like supply and demand type of pricing model uh, on a on a national park. Which, to your point, I think you're spot on that comparing Disneyland to the national park system is. Like it's not even apples and oranges. No, because Disneyland has way better corn dogs and the Earl of Sandwich. I don't know. So I've never been to Disneyland. I've been to Disney World, and I can tell you, every national park I've been to, I'd like to go back to. I, I can't love- say the same thing about <laughs> Disney World. I love, I love the national parks and Disneyland's corn dogs. And if somehow I could get both at the same time, that'd be okay. But I don't think that it should be managed like Disneyland. Yeah. So look, here's the here's the thing about the national parks. They are wildly overcrowded but maybe not in the way or overused but not in the way that we maybe that that this article makes you want to think about now now you, you have to preface something that's important and so i'm going to interrupt you for a second i might have been getting to it but they're not okay go ahead but go ahead they're not all crowded yeah what you're talking about is it's you you yeah these, i was gonna get issues, to that okay go ahead okay so so here's the here's the deal national with the national park system right so we have 422 units in the national park system Right. Of those 422, 108 charge for admission. The ones we're charging for admission are really the ones that get the, that the are jewels, used, the jewels that, that tend to have a lot more traffic in them. Right. Um, several years ago, the administration made a proposal to nearly double 
fee entry fees to the national park. And this article that you talked to, that you sent us, Gabriella, it, it pointed that out. It said, it said the administ- and then it was chastising the administration for for buckling to basically buckling to peer pressure, the overwhelming opposition to it. Um, but it missed some in in saying that it missed some really important details. One of those details is right now the na- the deferred maintenance backlog in the national parks is over twelve billion dollars. Great Amer- the a portion of the Great American Outdoors Act is is going to cut into that a little bit, but it's not going to eliminate that. The fee proposal that was made by Secretary Zinke uh, at the time was going to nearly double entry fees. It would have raised about seventy million dollars a year. And that money was intended to go towards some of the the maintenance back, backlog. If, if you think about a twelve billion dollar backlog, the amount you'd have to amount of revenue revenue you'd have to raise through increasing fees is uh, entry fees of user basically user pays for everything is off the charts astronomical. So that's one thing. The second thing is on that on that uh, one of the big controversies on that fee proposal a couple of years ago is. The fees that were going to be imposed on guiding services, and it was going to effectively put people out of business that were doing what the park service wanted them to do. Like one of the things the parks, one of the problems isn't with the number of people in the parks; it's how the people get into the parks. Right? It's everybody being in their individual vehicles going into the parks because they want to have the freedom to drive around wherever they want to go, and so you have these these businesses on the in the bedroom communities that are operating these tour guides with buses and vans and so forth. And they were going to, the proposal was going to raise the fees so much that it was theoretically for some of those businesses, it was going to, it was going to stretch the ability for them to survive. It was going to price them out because the fees were going to, it wasn't going to go to, to $70. It was going to be $1,500 a van or something like that. It was astronomical for the guides. And so if one of the objectives was to get more people to to use to alternate modes of transportation they created a fee structure that disincentivized that so there were problems with the that particular proposal that that was made um and and so like the article rightly points out that there's an issue but there are myriad underlying issues that that need to be addressed to to solve the problem you don't it's not about raising the prices and reducing opportunity for everybody else. And I know, you know, a place like Yellowstone or, or Grand Teton or Glacier or some of these big national parks that are incredibly isolated where anybody that wants to go is going to be spending a lot of money to get there. The doubling the fees probably isn't going to have much of an impact. But what about those park units that are close to big cities, for example, and and schools that are going to take field trips up to those parks or, you know, families that can't afford to take a vacation, but they can afford to go to a nearby national park for a day and hike and see these iconic places and and raising the fees prices them out. And I don't think that was ever the intent of the national park system was to cater to the elite. Right. And so um, there are other solutions that I, I was talking to the the um i call her the apt acting dec- deputy of the uh, national park service i actually had her come speak to a class that i teach a couple weeks ago and, and she was talking about some of the deferred maintenance issues one of the things she was talking about you want to talk about you know addressing these other issues so you don't have to raise fees and i'm going to get this slightly wrong um but we have all of these bathrooms in these national parks that were built in a certain era, like in the 1950s, and there's this particular design to them, 1940s, right after, 40s, early 50s, right after World War II, all this money went into building all these bathrooms. And it turns out bathrooms are about the most important thing in a national park. You don't have bathrooms, you can't have the park, right? They're really important. Well, you need to renovate and expand. Turns out a ton of these bathrooms have been designated as like historic places. (laughs) (laughs) And so to actually renovate one of these bathrooms, and there's Dozens and dozens of them, and they're just they're kind of if you've ever been to the top of Rocky Mountain National Park, for example, the bathrooms on the on Trail Ridge Road at the top of Rocky Mountain National Park like those are that's what we're talking about we're talking about kind of gross smelling like nasty looking bathrooms uh that you that can't that, that are now protected in a way archaeological that, it, that, that costs so much money to renovate rather than just being able to tear down the bathroom and build a much better facility for far less those are some of the systemic problems within the parks <laughs> service that that maybe we could be focusing on rather than how we how we um charge fees and 
it, you know, and like I like I noted, you double the fee, you only raise an additional seventy million in revenue for the parks system, and that seventy million it doesn't go back. Like there's this there's this law called the Federal Lands Recreation Enhancement Act. So it 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 te- that's the law that tells you how you use your park revenue, right? How you divide the fees. Eighty percent of those fees that are collected at the gate stay in, stay in the park that collects the fee. Twenty percent goes into a pool that's then doled, doled out to those those several hundred units that don't collect fees. So that's how they get their maintenance done. Um, little side note. So if even if you raise an entry fee at a park. That money's not all even staying in that park to deal with the deferred maintenance issues. It might be shot off someplace else. So there's Which a, it, is, it, is part of the issue too, and that's why I yeah. brought up the number of units. That, I mean, because honestly, there are certain parks that get a whole lot of traffic and they cost a whole lot of money, but there are people and buildings and revenue stream that justify that. We have a lot of national parks that have the rangers and have the buildings and don't have the fees coming in to help support those parks. And so, you know, that's, I mean, that's a reality that, that probably deserves a look is with the numbers of parks that we have, the ones that aren't the jewels, what now, you know, what do you do there? So anyway, just a thought, yeah. Gabrielle, what do you think? Yeah, that that's all very interesting. Um, one article that I read that really does, and I talked about this on my podcast today a little bit, There was a great article by a gentleman by the name of Sean Regan with the Property and Environment Research Center. So they're a free market environmental group. I've interviewed some of their staff. And he was a former park ranger out west somewhere in Washington State, I think Olympic National Park. And he talked about what needs to be done, how to take politics out of the National Park Service. It's a really good article. I recommend you guys read it. But he he broke down like what the real issues were. He didn't talk about the need to raise fees for entry and usage. He talked about all the different things and kind of how you said that certain buildings are condemned to be historical buildings, even though they're bathrooms. So you talked about should be condemned, (laughs) 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 but that was, I'll have to send that to you guys because I think that's often not discussed. And this was surprisingly an outside online magazine. I was surprised to see that uh, printed there, but it's, it was a really eye opening article talked about the deferred maintenance backlog issue, but from a really clear and concise and from a someone who had a firsthand account working in the National Park Service and kind of this clear-headed view with it. But yeah, there are a lot of issues to it. And I wholeheartedly agree that raising the fee would do nothing, especially as people are hurting, you know, recovering under this pandemic. And it just makes no sense. It defeats the purpose of why Theodore Roosevelt established it in the first place. I think it's an issue that supersedes partisan politics. You're going to find super conservative people like me agree and probably someone on the political opposite agree that there's really no, not capitalistic mechanism, but there's no corporate mechanism that really applies to this because it's under the purview of the federal government. It has different demands and needs. And this is probably one of the places where the government is seen as kind of a better arbiter. Certainly there could be improvements and there should be improvements made to the park service. And that's what hopefully this great American outdoors act will do. And hopefully some subsequent legislation or reforms that come in possibly in the future. But yeah, to, to say that you need kind of this outside influence to fix it. I don't want to see Coca-Cola signs in Yellowstone. I don't want to see a different kind of cheapening of the national parks, like what you would see at these different theme parks. And certainly you can have concession stands. I know at different parks, they do have concession stands, but I just don't want to see Coca-Cola everywhere (laughs) in these national parks. Well, then where does it end? Right. So if the argument is that basically users should pay, right, that the the cost of of maintaining a park should be borne by the user, then and you have to raise the fees to to cover that, uh, or you know, if you're just trying to price people out to to reduce impact, where does it end? Because our national forests, I can go to any time, and for the most part, I can go anywhere and not pay a dime. But I know there's a lot of tax money going to to maintaining trails and and facility restroom facilities and all sorts of things in the in forests and on BLM as well and how about in our uh, wildlife refuges is is a twenty five dollar duck stamp uh, for the refuges that require admission is that sufficient should we be paying more what about all the refuges that don't charge admission um, you know what about the the fact that you know with we talked before about oil and gas leasing 
you know, what about the fact that you know we have public lands and you know if you want to develop on oil and gas on private lands you're going to pay royalties of 18 to 25 percent but if you do it on federal lands it's 12 and a half percent right we we've made decisions in how we manage our public lands to make them as available to as many people for as many uses as possible and there are you, you take the good with the bad when you make a decision like that and i think in this case the good mostly outweighs the bad yeah well and i throw out national parks i'd like to kind of maybe this is the right comparison but think about your city park what if you told people that you know only you you have to you know you have to start paying a certain amount every day to go jog. You have to, you know, these are in your city park. And we've made decisions and these, and, and just because you're not paying as an individual user, when you roll up to the gate, doesn't mean that you haven't made a decision to pay for that park to be there, to pay so that you have the privilege of using it when you can. That's why they exist. And that's what our tax dollars every day do. And yes, you're not making the decision every day when you drive to that park to spend your dollar that day, but you have made the decision based on who you voted for, based on the acts of Congress, that you wanted these places to be available for Americans to go to, for you to go to, for your kids to go to, and you've been paying them for them for a long time. And you're going to continue to pay for them every day when you go to work. So there you go. That's my two cents. Mike, you have two cents on this? Uh, I can't afford two cents, so... Mike can't afford to go to the parks. Yeah, no, I, I, I guess uh, I, I, I agree with a lot of the things that have already been said around the problems that would come from raising the fees. It, they really are treated differently, and a lot of we need to have a mechanism that gets as many people in there as the parks can handle, but not too many, and and also have a way to sort of keep them up for the future generation. That's a tough battle. And I wonder whether the Zinke administration, when they did that, was really trying to propose an idea in order to get Congress to act on getting actual real dollars in there. Um, and so I, I kind of felt like that was a red herring when it was put out originally. Solid point. Yeah, it's just like, like that point, too. Yep, they weren't but, even trying. Yeah I, I, yeah, I think it was just to highlight an issue. Like, okay, you want to get people's attention, you, you throw out a concept that – um, might fire up some folks and, and get some action going. So, but the, you know, it, it, it is, we are practically giving it away for some of these um, crown jewel type um, uh, national parks. And it seems like there, there should be a way, it, it, it would be reasonable to raise it a little bit, um, but you can't compare it in, in any means with Disney. It's just not the same. Some I- things you just have to let folks in at a reasonable rate. My counter to that would be we, when I was with, uh, I don't know if you guys knew this, but I worked for the governor of Wyoming, I worked for Matt Mead. No way. But when I, but when we were doing that, if you guys recall, we did an, an event called the Great Outdoors, the Great Out, Great American great, Camp Out, the right? Great, yep. Something like that. Yep. And we brought one family from each of the Western states selected by a governor's office for those states out to, um, to do that. One of the requirements is they had to have a fifth grader, right? Because of the part, the kids in the, the, fourth, the fourth grade, fourth grade, the the, yep. the parks in the pa- the whatever. So every fourth grader in America can get a free annual park pass for their family. So yep. We, yep. Nephi, which one of you two ran this? It was, I did. It was Nephi that ran. <laughs> yeah. I just don't remember what it's called. I, uh, so he just talked to me about it so much when he was running it that I still remember all the details. So yeah, right. the reason sense. I bring it up is because guess how many of those families had been to a national park before that. I'm going with zero. One of them had. One One of them had. And so when you think about that, you know, for all this talk about like, oh, yeah, that ought to be worth more money. Those families came and and Coleman was a big sponsor. And of course, uh, lots of other sponsors, uh, Vista Outdoors and other folks came together to make sure that it was possible for those families to be there, bring, get them camping gear. They couldn't have afforded to be there. You know, there are a lot of people in this country who if you, you know, who, when you say, I, well, it's not a big deal. You know what? Companies stepped up to provide gas money for those families to drive out there to be part of that. There are huge numbers of people in this country that can't afford to go to those parks. And to say like, well, it's just 80 bucks to get through the gate or whatever it might be on that day ignores the fact 
that it, it requires a huge amount of investment for those families to get to go to those jewels and ever see them in a lifetime. Yeah. And many Americans never will. Yeah, it's spoken from a place of privilege when, when we yeah, make those the, kinds of statements. The, yeah. Certainly the value of those, of the experience in the park far exceeds anything we could ever rationally charge the uh, American population to go see it or the world. I mean, yeah. you know, if we could differentiate by your passport stamp, that might, that might help with my idea around funding it, but, but, but somehow I think that's not going to work either. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, they are so much more valuable in, in what they give and what they represent that you could never charge the true value. When you have an inner city family from St. Louis, Missouri, who comes out and that's their first experience in the great outdoors and they don't have sleeping bags, like check, you know, check your privilege and start thinking about what you have access to and that there are a lot of people who will, will never have that access. And it's important for us as Americans who care about whether it's hunting, fishing, or just recreation in the great outdoors. Remember this people that don't get that experience before they're 14 years old, the majority of them will never seek it and they will never have it. So think about that. Spot on. Gabrielle, you have any more thoughts on, on this? We've used a lot of your time, so I want to give you a chance to talk about this. And then I want to ask you one more question, then, uh, or maybe two questions, and then we'll wrap up. Sure. I'm surprised how many people here on the East Coast have not gone to some of the iconic national parks. A lot of my friends have been very deprived, and I was really surprised to hear this anytime we've talked about national parks in my friends group. They've really missed out. So I always tell people that, yes, you should go to the parks, visit them, definitely the iconic ones, and even the lesser known ones as well. And yeah, it's in terms of, I know, hunting and fishing access, they can be a little more difficult, and they're probably the most strident in terms of opportunities for us in the sportsman community. But there's a certain different draw to them. If you just want to go relax or just go explore with your family or friends, it's a really great way to kind of deplug, uh, explore your surroundings and see some really cool wildlife. I saw my first elk at Yellowstone about 16 years ago, and I will never forget that experience seeing it uh, sit down in the shade, chewing on something. I don't recall what exactly it was chewing on. Maybe some portobello Gri- mushroom. Grizzly bear. I didn't- <laughs> But I, they've gone cannibalistic because they, they have to to defend themselves. There's so many bears up there now. Anyway, sorry. Maybe, <laughs> no, maybe back then they didn't now. Maybe. <laughs> but, you know, I got to see these different wildlife. I heard wolves from like, I don't know how many miles away one evening. It was beautiful. All these different constellations. And we were camping. And my dad referred to these this cabal of Yellowstone wolves as like the Yellowstone choir of wolves or something, something really catchy. So like he made a story out of it or some fun kind of memory with it and would call these different names and references. So you'd hear wolves howling, you could see elk in, in the broad daylight. And it was just so wonderful. And I I've gone to several recently on the East coast, but I still have so many to go to. I have many to revisit back out West and yeah, you have a lot of joy when you go to national parks and they are kind of a bit out of reach, although, uh, out of the six, I mean, there are 62 national parks in their entirety. And I think they're more slowly becoming uh, national parks, but they're, like you said, they're like 400 some odd different units. So there's battlefields, there's, um, all these different types of, uh, layers of national park service land out there. So I always try to visit them here in the nation's capital. The national mall is considered an NPS property too. So you could you could go to a national park uh, service so land. So RFK Stadium, right? Yeah, I th- I think so. If I'm not mistaken, I, I believe it is you, too. You haven't seen RFK Stadium lately? It's really bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but isn't the underlying <laughs> land owned by the the Park Service? It could be. I think not it mis- is. Yes. Yeah. Right, right there on the Anacostia. Yeah. So maybe yeah. don't visit yeah. that piece of property, but <laughs> the, the national. Oh, yes, but yeah, for the sure. National Mall for sure. A um, couple of questions for you before we before we end. We we started this podcast, you know, getting a little bit about your background and, and explaining how we met you in person for the first time here a few weeks ago at a at this this hunt uh, up in the Black Hills, this whitetail hunt in the Black Hills. And I am curious, uh, without and feel free to tell the whole story if you want on your experience with your hunt. But I want to know what your biggest takeaway was from that experience, because I know you, on that, it was your first big game animal. And, you know, you worked it 
cradled from, from shot to freezer. Right. And, and then took it home with you. And I'm just curious now that you've, now that you've done that, what's your, um, what's your biggest takeaway from that experience that, that you would want to share with people? Happily. Yeah. I would say that I used to be really reluctant to want to get my hands dirty with picking apart different organs (laughs) and getting my hand bloody. But I kind of overcame that. And I was like, you have to do this out of necessity. Like if I'm going to be doing this for the long haul, I need to get over that whatever fear or kind of thing holding me back. And after I took that shot uh, with John and then obviously Scott and his daughter, uh, we all worked really quickly to gut and field dress our animals. And doing that with fairly relatively ease was pretty interesting. It certainly meant and kind of symbolized forging a connection with the animal you harvested, obviously. And I know with a lot of hunters, that's kind of the connection they feel like. It's not just taking the kill shot, but it's also doing everything afterwards, the aftermath, field dressing, and then processing, which you were so instrumental in helping me with. You you showed me how to do things. You certainly helped me expedite the process. And when I was uh, processing uh, some of the different cuts of venison that will be used for like burgers or uh, burritos or things of that sort, like I enjoyed speaking with your daughter and we were cruising through that and grinding meat and putting pork fat in it and going through the churning multiple times and, and just kind of doing that experience firsthand. And then with a little bit of assistance, I'm, I'm not shy about that. You were very helpful. And, and I learned a lot, uh, from just studying what you were doing to help kind of carve out the tenderloin, carve out the backstrap. And it was super eye opening to me and kind of reassured me that I could, if I were to harvest animals, something as consequential as a white tailed deer, let's say back here in Virginia, that I can confidently do it. I can confidently feel dress and with, in a pretty, pretty relatively short time frame, especially if you're doing it at sunset and, uh, just take away those skills that I learned from our weekend in Wyoming and apply it to my situation out here or wherever I may go in the future. And I took away so many valuable lessons, definitely the friendship and kind of the bonds that all of us were able to forge, uh, from the hosts, Mike and Pam to you guys, you know, I got to know you guys more and the other guests as well. And it was really fun. There was no judgment. I didn't feel uncomfortable. I've never felt uncomfortable in a setting like this with hunting. I'm always pretty welcomed and, and accommodated really easily. You guys took great care of me. And just to, to go through that process, cause I have done kill shots. I have, um, kind of deconstructed birds before, but they're a lot smaller and something like a white tailed deer, this white tailed doe that I got, it was certainly very different and I didn't want to cut myself. I was really careful to not do that. And that's certainly a natural fear that any new hunter has or someone who's pretty evergreen or green to the sport will feel. So I was really cautious and I didn't prick my finger. I didn't cut myself. I was really careful not to, uh, but to still also not puncture some vital organs and to cut as effectively as possible and even successfully cut around kind of more difficult areas or kind of unsatisfactory kind of awkward areas like towards the back end of an animal and all that. So it just getting more comfortable with that and just learning how to cut and, and process and just see that whole process unfurl and primarily be behind it myself. It was really eye opening, super educational, and I won't forget what I learned. I'm going to take that with me for every hunting situation. Hopefully in the future, I can disseminate that information and pass that down to whether it's kids of my own or to other friends who may pick up hunting, but I had a blast and you guys taught me a lot and I'm super grateful. And I was really honored to capture it through video, through town hall and through my podcast as well. So I'm really grateful. And I hope other new hunters and people in the media, uh, take up offers to do this, to learn about hunting, kind of go beyond the misconceptions that are awarded to hunting. I don't, didn't have those preconceived notions, obviously, but some other people who write about the subject don't really come about it from an open mind. Like I've always been comfortable with harvesting meat. I just never found the time to do it until I moved out to the East coast and was self-employed more so uh, to have these opportunities. Cause I was previously busy, always traveling, working for someone else. And it was really impossible to take time to take an interest in hunting. And when I started my own consulting business, I was able to set aside time to do that. And went through with it. But I think just these direct experiences in a really warm and inviting environment in a state where it's 
pretty feasible to go hunting. And I, I think the apparatus that we had with the AR platform and the suppressor, that was really comfortable shooting. And I totally agree that we need to make this kind of a more common setup for hunting because it is a lot better in terms of shooting experience, less noise pollution, better for the environment and better for people who may not be used to recoil and, and, uh, other idiosyncrasies that come with, with shooting kind of long, long guns. And yeah, I, it was fun also transporting that meat. Uh, Nephi took me to Walmart in Casper, Wyoming, and we found the perfect cooler to take with me. I was able to tape it effectively, no spilling, no nothing. And, you know, it was worth the $70 transport fee through Southwest through the baggage because I had two checked in luggages and, uh, paying the 20 some odd dollars for that. It was perfectly fine. It's, it's a lot cheaper than what you, your conventional meat at a grocery store. So all that divvied up with the transport, it wasn't too bad, but yeah, just the full circle coming full circle, um, learning how to do kind of the nitty gritty of it, being comfortable with field dressing and processing and just the whole process. Like I really did learn a lot and I want to talk more about it and educate people about it better, uh, with video or more podcast formats and hopefully more articles in the future. Um, just because, you know, someone with my platform, I can help educate people. And I have, and I got a little bit of blowback from people, um, not too much, but just your usual internet trolls who are like, how dare you like show this entertaining pose, trying to cheapen this animal's life. And I was like, I wasn't cheapening this animal's life. I was, yeah, I was a gripping grin. And certainly there's a lot of debate about the proper, <laughs> uh, format of whether or not you grip and grin, but I was trying to explain the full process but some people just won't understand some will, some won't, but generally speaking, it was positively received and you can have those type of, let's say more controversial pictures, but have an explainer. And then most people I think will see through it and and see that you're doing hunting out of a good intent, not so much to score points or score fame or to, to say that you conquered an animal. Uh, You also follow it up with other type of posts, which I tried to do with posting the, kind of tag notching picture and then other aspects of it too. And I'll try to do more posting of processing and meat, but I captured that more so with my video, but I think it's an educational thing. And anyone in media who wants to learn how to hunt should hunt with gentlemen like you guys, uh, people who work in the industry. And I think we can grow our ranks by doing that uh, with people who would be interested or people who have yet to discover kind of the joys of hunting And hopefully we won't have any more meat shortages, which will compel people to have to pick up hunting. But maybe that's one positive thing to come from the pandemic where people are interested in knowing where their meat comes from, having it locally and organically sourced through hunting. So it'll be really interesting to see if this kind of rise of hunting participation continues even well beyond the pandemic. So I'm really grateful. I'm grateful to you guys. And it's, it's been fun uh, to continue to talk even after that really memorable weekend. Yeah, I thought it was fun. I, I really appreciated the time you took to, you know, talk to my daughters were great. Um, and interact there because it, it helped make them feel at home and enjoy the situation much more. Someone, you were somebody yeah, they could look up to and relate to. Yeah, no, because it's always comfortable. I think I remember fishing and I would see older girls too. And that kind of was reassuring when I would go fishing with men. But no, your daughters were such a joy to talk to. They were really frisky and funny. <laughs> and I liked talking to them. No, they were they were really sweet. Yeah, and, I, and I'd, I'd echo Mike's comments with my daughter as well. She she had an, a, a great experience and part of her great experience was the time that she got to spend with you too. So I, I appreciate that. I appreciate the time you spent with her and, uh, you know, the, the uh, allowing her to be a, to try and be a teacher on the processing part too. She, she had a great time with that cause she's always been, uh, my processing helper and she felt like she could teach a little bit this time. So she loved that. Um, any, anyway, the, my, my favorite part of, of, of that process was watching you go from being very tentative with the knife in the process, in the processing piece, being very tentative to the knife, to, to learning how to use that knife, uh, you know, use the weight of the knife, use the blade of the knife, right. And, and make good cuts. And, uh, I I think that's going to serve you well going forward. So it was fun to watch the growth over that period of time, just on how you, like on how you were using the knife. I wasn't there for the shot. I was there for the after, right. But the, 
that part, you know, I, I, I was in, I thought you, you took to that well. And so I'm excited to, to see you do it again. All right. One more question for you. You ready? Shoot away. Go ahead. All right. So this is, this is something we ask everybody that's a, a guest on this podcast. And if you've listened, you'll know it's coming. If you haven't listened, we're about to blindside you. Uh, but it's the Your Mountain Podcast, all about things that relate to your land, your water, your wildlife, and those places that are near and dear to us. And everybody has places that are near and dear to them individually. Sometimes we have, we share places collectively, like we talked about with these national parks. A lot of people have places that are, are very important to them, uh, whether it's uh, some metaphorical place or some actual physical place, but it's their mountain, like their place, right? And so my question to you is, what's your mountain? What's Gabriella's mountain? Oh boy, my mountain, it's really hard to quantify because I have several places that I really have taken a liking to. Um, but I would say one of the cornerstone places that I would consider my mountain, even though I don't live there anymore, is just the Pacific Ocean. You know, growing up with that, it was always a place I looked to for inspiration. That's where I learned first how to fish, uh, doing deep sea fishing. Uh, and any ocean, I feel like, puts me at ease and brings this kind of sense of calm and serenity. And that, and now it's kind of morphed into, you know, finding little mountains in and around me in the DC metro area, but it's, it's really hard, but I'd say my first really consequential kind of your mountain type place would probably be the Pacific ocean. And yeah, I, I think that would be, yeah, the foundation for it. And uh, I'm grateful for that time there and, and that body of water and kind of what it taught me. And it provided a lot of backdrops to fun barbecues and bonfire activities, which I think are now banned in California. So I was able to kind of savor those last moments, but it was, it was a very teachable place, beautiful sunsets, a lot of life lessons and a great place to kind of decompress. So I think that would be my original mountain, if that's sufficient. Of course that's sufficient. It, it's whatever your answer is, is it's sufficient yours. and perfect. It's yours. That's what yeah. makes this so much fun and why we enjoy it so much. And I think, I actually think you might be the first person in all of the episodes we've done with all the different guests that have that have honed in on an ocean. So now you get some uniqueness there as well. So unique points. So thank you for sharing that. We really appreciate it. Um, also thank you for taking so much time with us this afternoon, this evening. Uh, we really, really appreciate the time that you've, that you've given to us and, and hope that we can stay in touch uh, as we move forward. Since we, since we seem to have some overlapping interests on these conservation policy topics. Uh, so uh, is there anything else that you wanted to add before? Where, where can we it? find your stuff, Gabriella? Yeah. I'm all over the internet, but more specifically, uh, people can check out some columns that I do. And I try to incorporate conservation related articles in my town hall column. So if you go to townhall.com, it's certainly a more conservative leaning website and that's what I am and, and all that. But I try to also write about kind of, more specific conservation issues if they relate to kind of a national dialogue there. So you could check out some pra uh, past interviews I've done with lawmakers, actually your guys's new Senator, Cynthia Lummis. I recently spoke to her and she was very interesting to talk to. And I've talked about why more people are going hunting in wake of coronavirus and, and other different types of uh, explorative subjects relating to the industry. And I think my column upcoming is going to probably be an expansion on Biden's picks candidates for interior. So uh, people can keep a lookout for my writing on townhall.com. Also district of conservation, which you alluded to earlier. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Two of my accounts have blue check marks. So those are pretty easy to find. And then if you type out Gabriella underscore Hoffman on Instagram, pretty easy to find me there. I also have a business website, GabriellaHoffman.com. I am trying to grow my YouTube account and kind of post extended conversations there. And I posted the vlog about the Wyoming hunt there as well, including uh, pictures and video footage of your hands and, and Ella's work with processing as well. Um, so they're, trying to they're great hands, by the way, model <laughs> hands. <laughs> so trying to expand on video storytelling there, not just simply me opining on different issues related to this field or this industry, but I want to interview more people that work in hunting and fishing and shooting sports and the related fields as well. So I'm going to try to use my platforms to do that in the coming year. 
I also have a series with a free market environmental group called CFAC that I host, and we're going to be rebooting my Conservation Nation series very soon. But I have three episodes that are already published there, so I could send that information to you guys. So I host a little video series there. And yeah, just all over the place. I think um, you can find me on Muckrake, which is my journalistic website. All journalists and freelancers have kind of a presence there, but pretty easy to find me. You Google and on Google searches now, you'll be able to see all my different links, social media accounts, which is really nice that Google does that. If you guys haven't done that for yourselves, make sure you get that taken care of so no one can impersonate you. Uh, But Google now can aggregate all your different digital properties and sync all your accounts to your name. So that's pretty much where anyone can find me. So just everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. (laughs) You might have to teach us how to use it. I will happily teach you. Absolutely. I don't think the three of us are savvy enough. Computers scare me. (laughs) I use my Motorola Razor flip phone. Yeah. I I miss my Motorola Razor. I I like carburetors. (laughs) <laughs> mufflers and yeah just nothing electronic uh, um yeah we're that that's why we're not that's really not true i'm actually the gear guy i love everything that makes noises and i was about to say that's why that's why we're not uh steven ronella big yet as we have no tech savvy whatsoever nah, it's, it's not I, our content uh, i i no we're uh we're 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 a more special kind of it's, yeah, we're Steve, niche. We're niche Steve, market. Steve is very broad. We are, you we're, know, we're niche. thinking man, Steve Ranella. Niche market. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, so I'm not going to plug all of that. Because <laughs> 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 I can't remember all of the play, uh, everything that you do and where <laughs> every place you are. But I will tell everybody uh, to make sure that you go out and, and subscribe and listen to the District of Conservation podcast. That one I can do. Uh, yeah. So, uh, just use my website. There you go. Say your website name again. GabriellaHoffman.com. Super easy to find. Perfect. Do you have any any last words before we wrap it up? I hope we can do some hunting like that again. That was a lot of fun. Um, if I can be a resource in DC, I'll try to have my ear on different things. If you guys want more information, but you guys are pretty plugged in in your own right, so I have no doubt. You don't really need my help in that respect, but let's stay in touch and maybe you guys can come on my podcast. We can cross pollinate. And if I can be a resource or help, I would love to continue to do so. You guys have been really helpful. And I think it's a start of wonderful friendships. The the feeling is mutual. Yeah. Yeah. So, so thank you very much. Um, thanks again for, for being here. Thanks everybody for, uh, for, for listening. Uh, as a reminder, if you haven't yet go out and hit that subscribe button, uh, on the, your mountain podcast too. Uh, in addition to district conservation, we'd love to keep you here on your mountain as well. Uh, there's room in the space for multiple podcasts. So subscribe to the, your mountain podcast, head out there and, and also give us that, that ranking, that five-star review. We'd really appreciate that. Leave us a, leave us a comment, send us emails. You know, the address your mountain at it's your mountain.com. Find us on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook at the handle at it's your mountain. And remember until next time that life is about experiences. So go have one.